I have a vivid memory, uh, and I'm not sure why memories sometimes just stick in your mind of certain circumstances in your past, but I have a very vivid memory of my very first day on the campus of Oklahoma State University. My parents had helped me haul all my gear, all my stuff up, up there, and I was moving in. And as it turns out, my roommate in my college dorm, he didn't show up. And so I'd gone to dinner and I, I came back and I remember sitting down on my bed. I was on the 12th floor of Wilhelm South, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but anyway, I was on the 12th floor and I look out the window and I have this this sense, there's something in me that says, you have a decision to make. You have a decision to make. Are you going to follow Jesus or are you going to follow in your own path? And, and I, it was just a very stark moment for me where I was like, you know, which, which way am I going to go? I, I grew up in Poto where everybody knew me. You know, I went to church with people. I wasn't going to get away with anything. Now I'm 200 miles away. I don't know anybody up there. Uh, who am I going to be? Like, what life am I ultimately going to choose? And in that moment, I, I'm very thankful that God gave me the grace to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. Now, as much as, as I might have made that choice, I have to give all glory to God. Because what I didn't fully understand in that moment is that it doesn't just matter which path you choose. It matters whose power you choose to walk that path in. Now, last week, we told you, if you were here, the Apostle Paul uh, teaching to the Galatians, and he shared with them that Jesus Christ had come to set them free, that they didn't have to live under the power of their sin any longer or under the, the law any longer. They were now free in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus Christ went to the cross and bore our sin, right? He's, he's paid the price for all of our sin and then credited his righteousness to those of us who come to faith in Jesus Christ, he would say to us that neither our moral accomplishments nor our moral failures count for anything. The only thing that matters for those of us who are in Christ Jesus is our faith working itself out through love. We are free in Christ. And we praise him for that. We're thankful for the freedom that we have in Jesus, right? Like that's where we are. But then the Apostle Paul is going to continue teaching them what it looks like, or more importantly, how to live this life of love, this life of following Jesus that we all ultimately want to live. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 16. Here's what Paul says. He says, but I, I say, he's like, I got to keep teaching here. Hang with me. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the de desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They are opposed to each other. There are two things within you that are going to try to lead you in your life. One is your flesh, your fleshly desires. The other is the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, this is for those of us who are in Christ. And then he goes on. They are, they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So what is assumed here, is, is, as Paul writes the letter to the Galatians, is that everybody wanted to live a life that would please God. The, the flesh might keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Again, it's assumed that the Galatians wanted to live a life that pleased the Lord. They wanted to experience the fullness of God in their life. And I would assume the same is true for you. Like as a man or a woman or a young person, like I want to live a life that pleases God. But Paul is pointing out there are two things that are competing. They're opposed to each other that are fighting for control of your life. One is the flesh and one is the Spirit. And so today, I want to talk to you about those two things. And we're going to start with the bad news first. I hope that's okay, uh, because then we get to end on a positive note, right? So the first thing that is, that is going on within you, the desires that you have, are the desires of your flesh. I told you last week that you were f uh, fearfully and wonderfully created by God. You were made in His image, fearfully, wonderfully created beautifully made in the image of God. He made you the way that you are on purpose. Your gifts, your abilities, your aptitudes, your personality. Like God made you the way that you are on purpose. And he has an ultimate purpose for your life. Now, the problem with, with, each, of us, with each of us is that sin has entered in. 
And while we were created in the image of God, that was marred and broken by sin such that our fleshly desires do not crave, we don't desire the things that are going to lead to our good. Instead, our flesh craves the things that are going to lead to our destruction. Like that's kind of how, that's our natural state of affairs in our lives. We crave the things that will ultimately destroy us. And this is not good news, right? That's not the people that we want to be. We want to serve the Lord. We want to live out the abundant life. The problem is that we have fleshly desires. Now, we live in a world that says, hey, if you want to live a full, rich, abundant life, be true to yourself. Follow your heart. Give yourself to your every, every desire, and then you're going to be full and satisfied. Well, it's simply not true. As a matter of fact, because of sin, our flesh craves the things that are going to destroy us. Like, th- that's really terrible advice. So if you've been given it, um, y- you're forgiven, right? It's okay. Just don't ever say it again, right? Because you're literally pointing people to chase after things that will bring destruction in their lives. Our desires are not healthy. They're not ultimately good. And it's true, not not just in, in, in uh, some aspects in our lives, but it's true across the board in our lives. Uh, this past week, I had a friend share with me a podcast talking about our, U- our U.S. healthcare system. And y'all, we're pretty blessed. I don't know if you know this, but uh, around the world, like people don't have access to what we have access to. So we have uh, here in the U.S. state-of-the-art medical technologies, the latest, greatest in medicine. We have wonderful doctors. I read something that said there are over 130 different specialties in medicine. I'm like, are there even that many parts of the body? Like, what are you specializing in, you know? But listen, we have access to amazing healthcare in America. And the good news is that we have a lot of money as well. And so we can go and afford healthcare, whereas many people in the world uh, don't have any access. We spend about twice as much as the average developed country on our healthcare. So man, it's a wonderful blessing, right? But then there's this weird thing about it. Best healthcare in the world, spend way more money than anyone else in the world on our healthcare, but we don't have better health than people around the world, other people in developed countries. Matter of fact, we're not gonna live as long as people in some other countries, and we have far more chronic illness than people who live in other countries. Like, what's the problem? Like, what's going wrong? The problem is us. It's our fleshly desires. Most of the chronic issues that we face as Americans, the reason we don't live as long, really boil down to the things that we eat and the lifestyle that we choose. So I don't know about you, but I experience this, right? I know what my flesh desires, and it's not the healthy stuff. I want the bad stuff. Like, I have a hard time in my flesh walking past a plate of brownies. I want the things that feel good, taste good. They're just not good for me. I mean, I'm well nourished. That's true. But uh, it's not ultimately what's best for my health. And then when it comes to exercise, y'all, I I really want to sleep in. I do not want to get up early and work hard and exercise. The problem is, is my fleshly desires don't lead me to that, which is ultimately good. And it's not just true with regard to our eating or our diets or the way that we exercise. It's true across our entire lives. And Paul wants to point that out to us. Uh, Look what he says here as we get to, I believe it's verse 19. I'm lost. I'm on the wrong page. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse uh, 18. Yeah, no, no, it's 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. He's like, you know what these things look like. You've probably experienced them in your life. Um, These things are evident to you. The works of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. If you are in Christ, you should have a really good sense that these things are not good for you. They're evident, right? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He's going to warn us about these things. He says, if you are in Christ, it ought to be evident to you that these are obviously not the fruit of the things of God. These are not accomplishing what you want. And yet in our flesh, in your flesh, you might look at that list and be like, hmm, I mean, sometimes maybe some of those things I desire. And sometimes I look at what my neighbor has and I think, ooh, I want that. And they got, they got sweet stuff and you feel that envy. We long for the things that they have. Or you might wanna linger over sexually immoral images because you think that's gonna gratify me, right? 
As believers, these things should be evident to us that these are not the works of the Spirit. They're not of the things that are going to lead to life in us. And yet, at times, we pursue them. Well, there's a, a few different lists here. The first, um, and the first things that Paul mentioned all relate to sexuality. And y'all, this has been a stumbling block since the first century, the Galatians, and it is a profound stumbling block for us today. When he says sexual immorality, he's basically saying practicing your sexuality outside of a lifelong covenant of marriage. Any way that you do that is going to lead to destruction. That, that's what this means. It's a Greek word, porneia, wide range of sexual sin. Um, as, as he continues on, impurity, this is unnatural sexual relations of any kind. And he goes on, sensuality, this is uncontrolled sexuality, promiscuity, giving yourself. Like God's given us the gift of sex, and what sin does is it takes it and distorts that, that desire. And rather than practicing it in the context that God has given it as a gift, we want to make it ultimate, right? We think this desire is ultimate. We make it an idol. And all, it, it will, in, in the end, it'll destroy us. It's not just sexual sin, though. There are religious sins. He mentions idolatry, sorcery, trying to get what you want um, by means of something other than God. He continues on, relational sins. And y'all, we've experienced these. We feel the pain of these. And while nobody would say, yeah, you know what? I want a little more hatred in my life. I think that would be really healthy for me and my family if we're not careful If we live life pursuing our flesh, trying to live our life in our own strength, these are the things that are produced. Enmity, hatred, strife. This is fighting with people. We don't enjoy this, right? Jealousy, anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. And then the last two things, drunkenness and carousing. The word there is orgy. It actually means just indulging your flesh. This can be overeating, right? A lot of repentance is going to have to happen today after this, right? We do that. We chase the desires of our flesh. Now, again, I want to point out to you that Paul said already, there are things that you desire to do in your life. You want to live a righteous life. And yet, if you try to live a righteous life in the power of your flesh, man, this is what's going to come of that. And you're gonna continue in sin. You're gonna continue in behaviors that ruin your life. Um, Most scholars would say that the way that the Galatian believers fell back into observance to the law is because they wanted to honor God. They're like, hey, we wanna live, we've been there and done that with the bad things, right? We we know what sin's like. We wanna honor God. How do we do that in our flesh? We try to keep the law. And it left them enslaved. They couldn't live righteous lives before God. It was empty. And maybe that's your story too. And you know the sting of sin. You feel the pain of broken relationships. You've been there, done that with your sexuality. And you know the harm that it brings upon your soul. Well, the good news here today is that we don't have to try to live the abundant life in the power of our flesh there's another option, and that is in the power of God's Spirit. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, God sends the Spirit, uh, His Holy Spirit to live within us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us, forsakes us. So here's what you need to know about the Holy Spirit. When Jesus took on flesh, right, he stepped down out of heaven, took on flesh, and lived the perfect sinless life. He did so in the power of the Holy Spirit. He experienced all the temptations that you and I experienced, the weakness of the flesh. He was frustrated with people. I mean, maybe it was like chariot traffic. It wasn't like what we experienced, but but Jesus, he knows what it is to have to bear with people, and he lived a perfect sinless life in the power of the Spirit, the same Spirit that now dwells within the hearts of those of us who have come to faith in Christ. Like there is hope for us now through the power of the Spirit, the Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives within you. But you've got a decision to make. Are you going to attempt to live a good, rich, and abundant life, a life that's pleasing to God in the, in the weakness of your flesh, or will you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Those two things are opposed to one another. Like one of those is gonna bring about destruction in your life. The other one is ultimately going to bear good fruit. Now, as I mentioned before, most of us are fairly, well, we're good believers in in the power of our flesh, aren't we? Like we know the power of temptation, our desires. I told you, it's difficult to walk past a plate of brownies, isn't it? 
I mean, I feel that. That's real life for me. And it's difficult to scroll past the inappropriate image that comes up on your phone. It is difficult for us to, to not listen to and repeat the gossip that we feel. It is difficult to not desire the things of this world. Many of us are very confident in the power of our flesh. Well, here's what I want you to know today. The, the power of our flesh looks like weakness compared to the power of the Holy Spirit. We have something far greater now living within us. It is the person of the Holy Spirit of God who now lives within us and empowers us to live the abundant life. He's gonna bear fruit in us. Now, I don't know where you are today, um, many believers I've found live in this really negative view of themselves where they see the weakness of their flesh. And you know where you've been, what you've done, how you failed. You're like, I don't know if I'll ever live for God. Man, I don't know if I can ever experience the abundant life. If I can just kind of get through this life and make it to heaven, I'm gonna be happy. Listen, Jesus died that you might have life and to have it to the fullest. He wants you to experience victory in your life. And Paul's going to tell us what that looks like. He's like, this is the abundant life. If you walk according to the spirit, here's what is born within you by the power of the spirit in your life. This is uh, Galatians 5, We're going to pick up. He's going to give us this list of the fruit of the spirit. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control against such things. There is no law. And when we think about our lives, how to live a full and rich and abundant life, these are the things that we want. We want to live lives of love for God and for other people. Joy, like I want to have a life of joy, not dependent upon my circumstances, right? And we want these things, but they will never be accomplished in the weakness of our flesh. They will only be accomplished as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, last week, again, Paul said, hey, the entire law, it's summed up in one word. You know what that word was? Love. Do you know who bears the fruit of love in our lives? It is the Holy Spirit of God. We love one another. You know what the Spirit really does for us? He consistently points us away from ourselves and back to our Savior. He fixes our eyes on Jesus and takes them off of ourselves. So when, when we think about Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us, that he endured the cross for you, like he knew your name and the number of hairs on your head and all of your sin. He saw you and he chose you to shed his blood for you. Like, I don't know about you, but that, that produces gratitude in my heart. And it makes me love the Lord. And what the Spirit does then is he points us toward Jesus. Uh, he, he evokes this love, produces the fruit of love within us. Is He begins to not only just ca cause us to love God, he causes us to love other people as God has loved us. This is the fruit that he bears in our hearts. He bears the fruit of joy that says, hey, it's not how are my circumstances today? Am I happy with what's going on? But he brings joy that we have a relationship with our eternal creator. That Jesus has saved us. The spirit cries out within us, Abba, Father, for the creator of the universe. That is joy, peace. Will we rest in the sovereign protection of the God of the universe, of our heavenly father who cares for us? Patience. Listen, when we interact with other people, if we try to be patient in our flesh, it ain't happening wrong. I've tried it. I really have. I've, I've attempted this. But you know how God bears patience in our hearts? The Spirit, He reminds us of how patient God has been with us. He reminds us that we have sinned against God far more than any single person has sinned against us. And yet God was patient with us. He was long suffering with us. Ultimately, he died to save us. And as we think about the patience that God has extended to us, we then extend that patience to others. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. We think upon the kindness of God to us. It bears the fruit of repentance within us. And we extend that same kindness to other, others. 
gentleness here, it actually, uh, it means humility. It means not thinking less of ourselves, but as C.S. Lewis would say, um, thinking of ourselves less. Jesus Christ was the King of kings and Lord of lords. He deserved all glory and honor and worship and praise. And yet Jesus, the King of kings, Lord of lords, he took on flesh and he became a servant who humbled himself in obedience to the point of death. And as we think about the humility of Christ serving as he did, we, we recognize when we follow him that we are called to humble ourselves and to serve others in the same way. Way. This is walking by the Spirit. He bears the fruit of patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self control. Praise Jesus. This is victory over those fleshly desires, self control in our lives. So then the question comes how do we do that? I'll be honest with you, I, I grew up in church. I've asked this question a thousand times of, of other people. And I'm like, how do we walk by the Spirit? Like, how do you do that? Well, Paul uses three words in particular that are gonna teach us, um, paint pictures for us of what it looks like to walk by the Spirit. The first word he uses in this text is walk. In the Greek, it's peripateo, and it gives us the idea of putting one foot in front of the other. It is walking by the Spirit. Here's what you need to know. God has sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within your heart. He is present with you. What this word would tell us is that it's not enough for Jesus to be present with us or the Holy Spirit to be present with us. We also have to be present with his Holy Spirit. Um, Aristotle was a great philosopher. And in, in Greek culture, they actually called his, his followers peripatetics, because of the way that no matter where Aristotle was, they were there too. If Aristotle went there, his followers, his students went with him there. Listen, it's not enough for, for the Holy Spirit to be present within us. We have to be present with the Spirit, which means moment by moment, minute by minute, step by step in our lives, we are conscious that the Spirit is there and dependent and reliant upon the Spirit to empower us and to guide us. Like we're looking to the Spirit when we wake up in the morning and we open up the Word. Like, hey, would you give me eyes that see and help me to understand your Word? But what we don't do is then close our Bibles and be like, I'm kind of done with God for the day. No, when we're running late and grab our coffee out the door, we're driving, we're, we're with the Spirit. We're saying, God, would you help me today to be the person you called me to be? Help me to have peace in the midst of this not very peaceful moment, right? And when you get to work and, and things are a mess from the weekend or whatever, like, hey, we're walking with God through that. The Holy Spirit is present with us, but we also should be present with him. Y'all ever have this experience in your household where your family's all together in the living room and you're physically present, but you're not really present? You know what I'm saying? I, uh, my kids do this to me, and I, I tell them it's because I don't hear very well. Uh, but honestly, it's usually because I'm just distracted, where all of a sudden they are screaming my name, and I'm like, why are you yelling at me? And they're like, because I said your name five times. You never responded, right? I'm present with them, but I'm not present. You know, that's the way that most people live their lives with the Holy Spirit, I and mean, he's in you, right? You're there together, but you're not present with him. He wants to lead you step by step and moment by moment. That's what it looks like to walk by the Spirit. But there's another word that he, he uses, verse 25. If we live by the Spirit. If walking wasn't enough, he uses this word live, which actually uh, you can translate it breathe. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, <clears throat> I, I, I've tried this in my life. I don't do very well with that oxygen. You know, if I try to jog down the block, but I'm gonna hold my breath the whole time, I don't get very far. It doesn't work out well for me. And in the same way for us spiritually, and if we're not breathing in the Holy Spirit, being dependent upon him to give life to our mortal bodies, if we're not walking in dependence upon the Spirit, we're not getting very far. Can I, can I tell you this truth? Heard it from Todd Wagner years ago. God does not wanna make you strong. He wants to make you dependent. 
right? God is the one who is strong. We're weak. What God wants us to do is to walk in his power and not our weakness. And so in every moment, we're just reminded, God, I can't do this. But you can. And many of us are more convinced of the weakness of our flesh than we are of the power of God. We stop with the first step of, God, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not faithful enough. All true, right? But then the next step that we take, as we breathe in the power of the Holy Spirit, we're reminded that he's the one that gives life to our mortal bodies. I'm weak, but you are strong, which then leads us to the the final descriptor he gives in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And this Greek word would give us a portrait of a a column of soldiers who are marching to the orders of their commander, right? When he says go, they go. When he says stop, they stop. This is consistent obedience to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Moment by moment, it's not, hey, what do I crave? What do I desire? What do I feel comfortable with in this moment? No, it's, hey, what is the Holy Spirit leading me to do in my life? Like, what would he have me do in this moment? Some of you, you're believers in Jesus, and you are missing out on the richness and the abundance of a life in Christ Jesus, empowered by his spirit, because you're refusing to say yes when he leads you. So maybe you're here, and God's called you to to begin serving or to begin giving, or maybe it's to share the gospel with your coworker, or, or whatever it might be, and you're like, you know, I'm just not really comfortable with that. And rather than walking in step with the Spirit, you're like, nah, I, I'm just gonna go my own way. I think I'd rather preserve my own comfort here. Here's what I want you to know. God sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross to set you free from your sins that you might then begin to live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, some people, when we talk about the Spirit, they get weirded out. They're like, oh, this is gonna be one of those Sundays. Like, people act strangely when they talk about the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit should be the most normal, expected, ordinary thing in the life of every single person. Believer, I know some people do crazy things with it, right? But ultimately, he should be our breath. He should be our life. This should be the normal pace of our life, walking by the Spirit of God. This is the normal expectation for every single Christian. So here's my invitation to you today. Will you embrace the abundant life that Jesus Christ has for you by submitting to his spirit right now. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus and he's drawing your heart to faith and you've been battling that, like, man, I, I, I wanna follow Jesus, but I'm not sure if I wanna follow Jesus. Would you just surrender yourself to the power of the spirit in your life today? Follow him in faith. And maybe you're here and you've been resisting the leadership of your spirit to invest in your church or invest in your neighbor to allow God to begin work through you. And would you just surrender yourself to him in this moment? Say, yes, but you're gonna have to accomplish this in me. Yes, I'm gonna share the gospel with that person, but you need to know I'm weak. I'm weak, but you're strong. I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna go. Would you surrender yourself to him? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the gift of the spirit. Lord, we are conscious of our weakness. We're conscious of our struggles. Lord, I don't don't think there's anyone here who's like, yeah, I just really want a life of sin and destruction. What we desire is your abundance, but we confess that we cannot accomplish that in our power. So Lord, may you in your grace draw us and help us to walk by your spirit and not in the weakness of our flesh. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, amen. So right now, I'm just gonna invite you to stand. This is your moment to respond. This is your moment to say yes to Jesus. Man, maybe it's yes to worshiping him. Maybe it's yes to serving him. Whatever it is, say yes to him.